allow us to do that and open more doors so that we can take it out even farther than it is now. Hallelujah. I want you to go with me this morning. I want to read first to begin this message, Matthew the 24th chapter. Matthew the 24th chapter and beginning in the third verse. Matthew 24 and 3, and I want to read a few passages of Scripture here and then get into the message that the Lord has laid on my heart. He did so earlier this week. And as I was listening to a radio program, which I'll share a little bit with you here in a moment. Matthew, the 24th chapter, in the beginning of the third verse, and we're all familiar with this. And uh, anytime someone teaches about the last days and, and talks about the tribulation period to come and the coming of the Lord... They usually end up in this chapter right here. But I want to read a few verses. The Bible says, And as he said, talking about Jesus upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Verse 5, For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Verse 7, For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in divers places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. You see, the hurricane that we saw hit the eastern coast, that's only the beginning of sorrows, as bad as that is and as much as I feel for those that have been hit with that and they're going through that. Many, I think, 100 plus people lost their lives and many, many, many more than that lost their homes. They need to be in our prayers. Amen. But this type of devastation is not going to be something that is strange to the end times. He says that the end is not, he says, this is the beginning of sorrows in verse 8. The end is not yet. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and shall be, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. I'm not reading the New York Times this morning. I'm reading out of the Word of God. The love of many shall wax cold, but he that shall endure to the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Jesus speaking to his disciples here is talking about, they want to know what things are going to happen before the end. What shall be the sign? And of course we know he starts off with telling them be not deceived because that is one of, that is the most prolific sign that you will see in the day that we live in. The spirit of deception has never been more rampant than it is today. We have never had more people deceived than we do today. And it doesn't seem like it's slowing down any. Every other day someone comes out with a new doctrine that a few thousand or more decide to follow. Even though it's not based on the word of God, they decide to follow it anyway. Simply because man said so. But it's more important today, not what man says, but what God says. Jesus makes a statement to them here, and He says, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you. You shall be hated of all nations for My name's sake. So Jesus tells them that there is a time coming when they will be killing you, they will be torturing you, they will be putting you to death for the cause of Christ, for the gospel of Jesus Christ. They'll be putting you to death for My name's sake. And we here in America, we sit here on our pews and we talk about this, Brother Sleece, and we look at this scripture and we think, well, those days are coming. It's going to come. Well, I've got news for you today. Those days are already here. We're not seeing it in America yet, but it is already here. I want to share some things with you. Last year, 765 churches were destroyed in Nigeria. In Bruton, a missionary was sentenced to life in prison for showing a film on Jesus Christ. After communism took over North Korea, an estimated 300,000 Christians disappeared. Mm -hmm. wonder what happened to them. 
They shall deliver you up to be killed. You shall be, you, you shall be hated for my name's sake. And these are just a few. I don't have time to go through everything. I don't have everything up here this morning. These are only a few things that I put down here. After the Egyptians rallied together to overthrow their country's dictatorship, Muslim radicals began burning Christian-owned buildings, kidnapping people, and threatening that any Christian who dares to leave his house would be killed. Another lady in Pakistan Alsi Bibi, a Pakistani wife and mother. She was beaten and charged with blasphemy and sentenced to death. You know what her terrible crime was? She told some of her co-workers that Jesus Christ sacrificed himself on the cross for our sins and that he is alive. So she was beaten and sentenced to death for sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And all of these, these are just a few of the things that take place around the world. This week, as, as while I was listening to News and Views, they were interviewing a man on there who I believe was of Asian descent, and he was part of a ministry with an outreach to Asia. And as he began to talk to them, he began to say some things that stirred my heart. They began, of course, by getting his information and talking about his ministry there the different people that are being persecuted for the cause of Christ and how that the outreach of their ministry was to help them. But during this, they had to take a break. You know how they do in television programs and radio programs. They have to take commercial breaks. And Whenever they came back from the commercial break, the man began to make, began to make these statements that I wanted to share with you today and with our listeners by radio and out there by video today as well. He asked this question of the man that was hosting the program. Normally it's Chuck Bates, but he had a sedium because he was gone somewhere. This man asked the host this question, how long has it been, because they were talking about the lack of, see today is the International Day of Prayer. It's a day in which we're supposed to pray for all of our brothers and sisters that are being persecuted around the world, those that are giving their life for the cause of Christ. And then we're talking about the lack, what seems like the lack of concern by Christians in America over the lives being given for the message of Jesus around the world. You don't hear too much about it. I guarantee you if you turned on most televisions, uh, Christian television networks on Sunday morning, but per average, or at least most of the time, they might have said something about it this morning because of the day it is, but most of the time we don't talk about it. It's not something that is discussed, Brother Sleaze. It's, it's not a happy subject. It's not a popular thing. You won't find the preachers with the smile plastered on and the big Colgate smile telling his congregation this morning about the people being beheaded or their limbs being cut off or their tongues being cut out of their mouth because of speaking the name of Jesus. Those that are persecuted for the message of Jesus Christ. So you don't find that. So it leads you to believe that there is a lack of concern in America today amongst our churches whenever it comes to the persecuted brothers and sisters that we have around the globe. But he asked this question of the moderator there. He said, when is the last time you heard a sermon on sin? In most of the churches, now I know you're sitting here today and you're thinking, we hear them all the time. Yeah, that's because y'all's blessed with me. <laughs> but in most churches in the United States today, you do not hear sermons on sin. He said the problem, he directs not just only at the Christian in the pew, but he said the problem is in the pulpit. That's what this man said. Almost had to stop the van and pull off the side of the road and do a victory lap. <laughs> Amen? Around the van. He said the problem is in the pulpits. He said, when is the last time you heard a sermon on sin? He said, also, you can look at the bestsellers that we have of Christian authors on the New York Times bestseller list. How many of those are on sin? How many of those books deal with the fact that the church needs to turn, by, turn from their wicked ways and turn to God? How many of those deal with sin and the consequences? How many of, how many, when's the last time you heard a preacher say that our problem is we're sinning against God? So he begins to bring up all these things and he begins to stir me up, needless to say. He says, how, many how long has it been since you heard a sermon on sin? 
What's the most popular things? And then he directs his attention to the commercials that they had just played. He said, I'm not against commercials, don't get me wrong, and I don't mean to be doubting any of your sponsors, but during the break, there were three or four commercials played, and what did they deal with? They dealt with weight loss, had better hair, looked better, feel better. His point was that they were all self-centered. He said, that's the problem with America today. Self-centered, and it doesn't stop with the world. It is infiltrating the church. No longer is there a burden for other people. It's all about self. No longer do they see the whole picture. All they see is self. That's the kind of doctrine that has infiltrated the church today. That's where the problem. That's why we're not concerned about our brothers and sisters that are losing their lives in other countries for the cause of Christ because we're too busy being concerned with self. That's the kind of books that you see on the New York Times bestseller list written by our pastors of our mega churches around America today. It's not about sin. It's not about the message. It's not about the gospel. It's about self. America is engrossed with, with a self-centered mentality. And so is the church. It would behoove us all today to think about somebody besides us. It would do us some good today to, to worry about somebody besides us, to be concerned about somebody besides us. And that's what this man with this ministry to Asia was trying to bring across. And oh, he did a better job of it than I'm doing here this morning. But he was talking about the self-centered, self-engrossing, and so goes the message of the modern day church. You see, one of the reasons we can't understand or maybe one of the reasons we don't have as much compassion as we need to for those that are giving their life for the message of Christ is because we've forgotten what Christ's message really was. The message of Jesus was not a self-centered gospel. Maybe that's why. Maybe we need to go back today and look and see what it was exactly that Jesus preached. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe we, don't, we can't comprehend or we don't, and we think that this is a terrible thing that's coming. This persecution for the message. Listen, i got news for you. There ain't, much there ain't much persecution going to be had for the church in America as long as she keeps preaching the message she's preaching because there's no persecution in that. The message that's being preached in most pulpits in America today is not a message you'll have to give your life for. They're not going to bother you. You're not going to suffer persecution for the message that you're preaching. Because even if they don't like the Jesus that you claim to be a follower of, well, that's okay with you. Because everybody's following their own God. We'll all get to the same place. And in the end, there's an economical demon that has taken over the pulpits of America to where that if you do stand for something, if you do preach something that goes against the grain, if you do stand and say there is no other way, if you stand and preach the principles of the Bible, then you become the odd man out. And not only will you suffer persecution from the world, But the way that they did Jesus, you may suffer persecution from the church. You see, it wasn't just a bunch of old ungodly worldly people that crucified Jesus. It was religious people. It was religious people. The persecution that you will suffer for preaching the message that Jesus preached will not only come from the world, it will come from within the church. I saw this week on one of the news programs on Fox News they were showing, and I don't know if it was an advertisement, I don't know what, what it was. It was a speech given by a, a bishop. I don't even know where he's from, Chicago or somewhere, I, I think. And he was talking about how that Christians should not support anyone that supports abortion. They should not vote for anyone that supports killing unborn babies. They should not support anyone who supports gay marriage and homosexual, homosexual rights as, as being on the same level as a man and woman getting married and so on down the line. And then the news program had two other preachers on there, two pastors, and neither one of them agreed with what the bishop said. Why? Because he was too narrow-minded. He was too dogmatic because he, they didn't view the Bible like he did. All he did was repeat what was in the Word of God. See, I'm telling you. The persecution will not only come from the world. It will come from the religious people. It will come from what is called the church today. And I use that in quotations because it's not actually the church. It's a religious crowd that claims and purports to be the church. 
But they're not preaching the right message. They're not preaching the right gospel. Let's find out what Jesus preached. And maybe, maybe if we can figure out what Jesus preached, if we can once again get a, get a, a vision of the real message, which is not the message of greed, not the message of prosperity, but the message that Jesus preached, if we can get a vision of that today, then maybe we can see how it is a message worth dying for. I got news for you. The message that's preached in most uh, churches today in America, the most popular message is not a message that I want to give my life for. It's a mess. Not a message. Amen. It's a mess. So let's see what Jesus... Jesus was narrow-minded. you know that? You might say today, what? In the world, does them suffering over there have to do with me? Paul would put it this way in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Listen to what he says. Hebrews 13 and 3. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them. And them which suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Did you hear what Paul said? Let's look at it. He said, remember them that are in bonds. In other, in other words, remember those that are in prison. Remember those that are persecuted. He says, remember those that suffer adversity as if you were suffering too. Remember those that are bound and that are in prison for the cause of Christ as if yourself were bound and in prison for the cause of It should bother you today to hear of people that are losing their lives for the cause of Christ. It should put a burden on us today. We should be burdened today for our brothers and sisters in another land that are laying down their life for the message that we're supposed to be preaching. For the gospel, the message that Jesus preached. Not the messages that you hear in our full churches across America today. Our churches are full this morning with those who came to what? They wanted to hear their sermon. They want to enjoy their fellowship. They want to enjoy their worship. They may just want to make a religious spectacle of themselves. They just might want to show up and appease their conscience. Whatever reason they have for coming. But what about those today who get no sermon? What about those today who do not have the freedom? They don't have a church to go to. How often do we think of them? How often do we kneel and pray for them? Oh, this hits every one of us today. I, don't, I doubt very seriously any of us spent very much time this week saying, Lord, you see our brothers and sisters that are persecuted, that are losing their lives for you around the globe. Lord, have mercy on them. Move on them. Give them peace. Give them strength. Give them encouragement. Move on their mind, their soul, their body. What about those this morning that get no sermon? What about those this morning that have no church? What about those that cannot fellowship? What about those that cannot assemble themselves together? It would do us all good this morning to remember them. Not only on the International Day of Prayer, but in our daily prayers as well. It would do us good this morning to remember them when it just seems like a burden for us to get up and get ready and go to church. When it seems like, oh, I just hate to get up and go. I hate to... I've heard people say, I, I go to church. I just hate to get ready. Might do us some good today if we think about those that have no church to go to. They told a story. I was watching a video online. They told a story of a preacher who the authorities came in and tore his church down and hauled everything out and burned it down and made him stand there and watch as they did it. They told him that they had another man with testimony, a pastor who they had kidnapped and they tied his hands behind his back and made him stand for 12 hours a day with a gun pointed to his head wanting him to denounce Christ. But he wouldn't do it. See, that's a message worth dying for. The gospel that Jesus preached. Not the gospel of, not the gospel of inclusion that, that Brother Sleece was talking about this morning that everybody's saved and everybody's okay and that we're all serving. We're all going to the same place. No matter whether you're serving Allah, Buddha, Muhammad, whatever, we'll all get there in the end. You're going to get somewhere in the end, all right. But there is still only one way to get to heaven. That's Jesus Christ. That is the message. That's what they're dying for. When a gun is put to their head and they say, well, you deny Christ, and they say no, and the trigger's pulled and they blow their head off, that's why they die for the message. The message of Jesus Christ. Not the mess that we got going on in America today. 
but the gospel that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. It would do us good today to remember them whenever it seems like it's just too much trouble for us to go to the house of God. <clears throat> it would do us good to remember our freedom and our liberty today and remember those that do not have it. And maybe one of the reasons we've lost sight of the part of the body of Christ that suffers for the gospel is because we've lost sight of what the real gospel is. And there, you might not have lost sight of it today here in this place. But many, 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 matter of fact, most of the percentage, biggest percentage of the church today has lost sight of what the message really is. They preach the gospel, but it's not the gospel, it's another gospel. It's preached here in America today, and it is preached more than any message that comes across our pulpits. And it's not the message that Jesus preached. It's a gospel of inclusion. Jesus didn't come to bring everybody, all the religions together. Matter of fact, He said that He came to cause division. And it will cause division. Because His message will set you apart from the rest of the religions. When you stand and say Jesus is the only way, unequivocal, no backing down from that, no way to compromise, when you say that, it will separate you from religions of today. It will divide you. It will send division because it will separate you from the crowd whenever you begin to accept and embrace Jesus and reject the other religions of the world. And I'm telling you, we're seeing it more and more. I've heard pastors say, in our church we have Muslims that worship with us. We have homosexuals that worship with us. We have Catholics that worship with us. You could go on and on down the line. People who practice Hindu, they worship with us, whatever the religion might be. They worship with us. And something's wrong. Because the message of Jesus will separate you from the crowd. When you get up and preach, Jesus is the only way to heaven. And if you don't accept Him, you're going to split hell wide open. You're going to lose some of you Muslims. You're going to lose some of your Catholics. That counted their beads last night. Amen. When you get up and preach that Jesus is the only mediator between man and God, Mary is not in the middle, not even included in the plan of salvation, you're going to lose some of you Catholic brethren, as you call it. Jesus didn't come to bring everything together. He didn't come preaching an economical spirit. He came preaching the truth, and the truth will separate you from the rest of the bunch. The truth is what they're dying for. Amen. You can say, well, why don't they just why don't they just tell them that they don't know Jesus and that they why don't they just tell them, you know, that that okay, I renounce him. But then in secret, no, you can't do that. The Bible said, Jesus said, if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my father. You might think today that I can, well, I'll just tell them I'm not a Christian. I'll tell them that I renounce Jesus and I don't follow him and I don't believe he's real, but in my heart, I know the difference. You better read the Bible. If you deny me before man, I will deny you before my Father. Amen? You can't do that. Somewhere along the line, the line is drawn in the sand and you have to take a stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ or compromise one or the other. What was Jesus' message? What did He preach? You might say, Brother Billy, what famous preacher or author are you going to use today to let us know what Jesus came and what, why He came and what it was that He preached? Well, let's go straight to the man Himself. The Bible says in Matthew, the ninth chapter, the 12th verse, this is Jesus speaking to them. He said unto them that they, be, they that be whole need not a physician, but they that are sick but go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am come, this is what he came for, I am come to call the righteous, not the, I, would, I am come not to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners to repentance. Amen? I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So why did he come? This is one of the reasons that he came. I came to call the sinners to repentance. Those that were in darkness, I have come to call them to the light. Those that are lost, I have came to seek and to save them. That's why He came. That's what He stood before God. He didn't come to make you rich. He didn't come so that you could drive a BMW. 
He didn't come so that you could be a millionaire and have a mansion on the hill. Whenever you talk about those things and you act like that's the reason He came, you belittle the real purpose of the cross whenever you talk about prosperity and you tie that in with the blood sacrifice. i got one question for you today. In the Old Testament tabernacle, when they, when they sacrificed the lamb, what purpose was that lamb for? Was it for the prosperity of the people? Was it so that they could come into some money? Was it, was it so that they could wear better clothes and have a nicer home? No. It was for remission of sin. It was for redemption of sin. It was for forgiveness of sin. Period. That's why Jesus came. He said, for this cause came I into the world. Don't stand there and tell me if you're not rich, you're out of God's will. Can you imagine telling those people that? Can you imagine telling our brothers and sisters in third world countries that are living in poverty, that are giving their lives for Jesus, persecuted, and that they, they, they don't have two dimes to rub together, not even hardly a house or a roof to put over their head and telling them, well, you must not be in God's will, yeah. You must be full of baloney because that ain't Bible. Amen? Jesus didn't come to make you rich. Now, I'm not saying you have to live in poverty. I'm not saying that the Lord won't bless you because He will. But whenever you bring what He down, what He did, down on the level of worldly possessions, you are belittling the reason that He came. As a matter of fact, Jesus Himself said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. But Jesus didn't preach the gospel of prosperity. He didn't preach the gospel of greed. He didn't preach a kingdom in this world. He said, my kingdom is not of this world. Hallelujah. He came and preached a message that He was the Lamb of God. He was the sacrifice for the sin of mankind. That He had been sent to be the one to reunite God and man once again. That we through Him might have life. That we through Him might be saved. And the message has not changed. The church has changed it. Religion has changed it. But Jesus' message is still remains the same today. He, is, he came to seek and to save that which was lost. He himself said in Luke 12 and 51, Suppose ye that I come to give peace to the earth. I tell you nay, but rather division. You see, he didn't come with a in a spirit of economicalism to bring all religions together, to make one world religion. No, He came and stood in contrast, right in the face of the Roman religion of that day, of the past Pharisees and, and Sadducees and hypocrites of that day, to tell them there is only one way, and I am it. That was His message. That's the message they're dying for in other countries. That's the message that you're not hearing preached in all of our churches today as they should be. Jesus said in John 10 and 10, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Someone told me this week they heard a pastor preaching and he said that's proof right there that Jesus wanted us to be prosperous. That's proof right there that Jesus wanted us to be rich. Let's look at it a little closer. He said, I'm come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. What it is he talking about? He's talking about life. What about life? That it would be more abundant. He's talking about a life of not sorrow, hatred, and grief, but a life of peace, a life of joy. He's talking about a life to come. He's not talking about your best life now. He could not have been talking about prosperity. If so, you talk about having to read between the lines because this would go right into the face of everything that He preached to His disciples. Mm -hmm. He told His disciples, when you go out to preach, don't even take your purse with you. Mm -hmm. Amen? Don't take your purse with you. Abundant life has nothing to do with money. Oh. There's a shop today. Abundant life has nothing to do with your bank account. Just ask those that had the money, had the bank account, had the mansion, yet ended it all because they were so miserable they couldn't stand to live another day. Abundant life has nothing to do with possessions. I'm not saying you have to live in poverty, but I'm telling you Jesus did not preach the gospel of greed. He did not preach the gospel of prosperity. 
He came so that you could have something greater than what this life has to offer, Brother Sleeth. He came so that you could have riches that this world knows not of. He came so that you could have life and that that life that He gives, talking about a spiritual walk with Him, that life would be more abundant that you could have a greater, more abundant life through Him. He said in John 12 and 46, I am come a light unto the world that whosoever believeth on Me should not abide in darkness. And if any man hear My words and believe not, I judge him not. But I am come not to judge the world, but to save the world. So He came so that those that sit in darkness no longer had to. Oh, I wish the church could get a hold of that this morning. His real message. He said in Matthew 20 and 28 that He came to give His life a ransom for many. He said in Matthew 18 and 11, for the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. He said the same thing in Luke 19 and 10. When he spoke to his disciples in John the 12th chapter, he said, Now is my soul troubled, but what shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I unto this hour. When he stood before Pilate, and Pilate said, Are you a king? Jesus answered and said, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, for this cause came I into the world. What cause? To give his life a ransom. To be the Lamb of God to die in our place so that we wouldn't have to go to hell, so that we could have salvation through Him, so that we could go to heaven only through Him. And we, the church, His followers, those who believe in Him, those who trust in Him, are commissioned to carry the same message that He preached. And if He didn't preach the message of prosperity, then we are not commissioned to preach the message of prosperity. He commanded the church... In Mark, the last chapter of Mark, some of the final words in the 16th chapter of Mark says, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What gospel? The message, the good news that Jesus preached. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's what they're dying for. You see, this message that I'm talking about, the message of Jesus, when you embrace His message, his message leads you to Him. He is love, so that leads you to love. and You will never know real love unless you embrace Christ. And once you do, that love will lead you to a place to where that you will lay down your life for the very message that Jesus preached. That's a message worth dying for today. That's a love worth dying for today. Do you know where the message of the modern day church in America leads you? It leads you to love, but it leads you to love of material things, love of money, love of things, love of self. That's where the message of the modern day church leads you. But the message of Jesus will lead you to not only love of, for Him, but love for lost souls that are dying and going to hell. I thank God today that I would not be able to stand before a congregation of 20,000 <coughs> And look at those people that I know a lot of them are lost and say, you're okay. You can have your best life now. Just have confidence in self. Just make sure you have positive attitudes and positive thoughts. And I wonder how much weight that's going to carry at the judgment. When you stand before Christ, preacher, and give an account for the mess that you preached, you can have all the kind of positive thoughts you want, but it ain't going to take away the judgment. The message of Christ was the message that He came to give His life for all of mankind. That He loved us enough to die for us. And whenever we realize that, whenever we preach that, whenever we share that, then and only then can we realize that there is a message, there is a love to die for today. The love that we have for Jesus, the love that He has for us, the message that He came to preach that's why they're dying. That's why they give their lives. I ask you today to please remember to pray for those that are persecuted for the cause of Christ. I read a story some time back about 
I don't, I don't remember if it was a boy or a girl, but they were younger and they had snuck off in one of the other countries. They had snuck off to go to meet with some other believers. Whenever they got back, their person that was over them, I don't know what they called them, master or what over there, but found out where they'd been. Took them and put them up against a tree and took a nail and drove it through their eyeball and nailed them to a tree. For what? Because they assembled together with some other believers. Something that we take for granted. Well, I don't feel like going. I'll go next week. You might. You might not. There is a message today, but it's not the message that we hear in most of our churches. It's the message that's being preached over there. Not that you can get... Can you imagine the effect you would have if you went into those third world countries, if you went into those, some of those villages and said, you have to be rich to be in God's will. Well, you wouldn't bring them no hope at all. But when you go to them and you put your arms around them and tell them that Jesus Christ loves you enough that He died for you, that you can have peace of mind, that you can have joy in your heart like never before, that you can go to heaven. You don't have to go to hell. Oh, that's the message. Accept Jesus today. That's the message. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. That, Brother Sleas, is the message. That's the message. That's the reason they're dying. That's the reason that most of the church in America won't suffer persecution because she's not preaching the truth. And those that are preaching the truth will suffer persecution, but it won't be just from the world and the government. It'll be from the church too. Because the church has embraced a spirit of economicalism that causes you to be wrong whenever you preach what Jesus preached. Jesus did not compromise. He didn't say, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me unless you've got a different idea. Unless you've got a different religion. No, He said, he, regardless of what Oprah says, Jesus is it. No other way. You'll come by way of Jesus or you won't go. That's why they're giving their life. We might end up having to do the same thing. I just hope that there's enough of us that will preach the truth that have enough backbone and the love for Him to say, kill us, we're not going to change. That's what they are going through. Let's remember them in prayer today and every day. Someone else this morning have something before we go.